And with that said, Yuli, the uh, screen is over to you. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, and thank you everybody for joining. Uh, so this is a joint work with Eduardo Feingold, who, who is here and uh, he can um, answer any questions. And uh, Eduardo is really, really a pleasure to work with. Uh, um, I really enjoy working with him. We had a lot of fun working on this paper. Um, so this is a paper about um, uh, stochastic games. Um, and I want to say first that stochastic games, they are very important. They are at the very foundation of game theory. So Shapley paper 1953 introduces uh, stochastic games. These are multiplayer generalizations of a, uh, a dynamic programming problem like uh, Bellman and Blackwell type of a problem. So what happens is that um, it's uh, several players, they interact, um, they choose uh, actions, um, and their actions affect how uh, the state evolves. Uh, the payoffs of the players, they depend on the actions they choose and the state that uh, uh, they are in. Um, and states evolve uh, according to transition probabilities that depend uh, on the players' actions. So let me give a couple of examples of uh, these games. So one is a um, competition between firms where firms, they invest in capacity. Uh, so here, capacity, it's a, a state variable. So there's actually a whole vector of state variables, a capacity for each firm and uh, uh, firms they compete. Um, so firms could also be in an R&D race. Um, so they invest in R&D and uh, the knowledge that they have accumulated, the patterns that they have, this is the state. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, this is a stochastic game. Um, so moral hazard in teams. So uh, uh, two or more uh, partners, they work together on the project. Um, and uh, they put in effort to develop this project. And this is a situation that Holmstrom, for example, analyzed. Um, and uh, um, so this is another example. Or games of political compromise when there are several parties and the parties, they could be in power or out of power. And when they're in power, they could choose to um, uh, grab the whole pie or share with the other party. So this is, this is another example of a stochastic game. So there are uh, many examples in uh, many different parts of economics. Um, and uh, uh, moral hazard and imperfect monitoring uh, is a common feature of these applications. So this is something that we are also going to have. Um, and um, yeah, so these games are, are important. Um, uh, so let me let me show you a model that uh, we have. So this is a general model, and I'm going to give a couple of examples straight after. So things that are not clear uh, on this slide, they will become clear uh, in just a bit. Yuli, can I interrupt for a second? So I'm not sure if this is an issue on my end, but I still see your introduction slide. Oh, you still see my introduction slide yeah do you see the slide now no i still see the same thing ah huh. okay so that's okay, one more time yep now i see the model slide now you see the model slide okay so i'll keep uh, thank you for bringing this up I'll keep checking. Uh, okay, so uh, the slides that you haven't seen, probably one is this slide that Shapley uh, introduced the Gusta Games, and then this slide has uh, uh, several applications. Okay. All right, so I'll just show them for a brief second. And so the model is there are n players, and uh, um, the actions are uh, unobservable. So 
players choose unobservable actions, but some, some uh, information about this action is available through signals. Okay. Uh, so the, there can be signals which are pure information, and then there could be signals which are also payoff relevant states. Okay. So, uh, and there's a whole vector of signals. Uh, the drift of the signals depends on the actions of the players. And then there is some noise, so uh, observation is imperfect. Okay, so this state uh, state vector it uh, moves around until it uh, hits uh, the boundary of the state space. So, for example, it could be that a team is working on a project, and this is the state of the project, and either the project uh, succeeds or it fails. Uh, so the payoffs of the players, they depend on um, the actions that they choose and uh, the current value of the state. Uh, and uh, there is some termination payoff, which uh, is received when, uh, uh, when the game ends, when the state hits uh, uh, the boundary of the state space. Okay. So, so the boundary is like an absorbing state? The boundary is like the, an absorbing state. So when the boundary hits, uh, the game ends. And this is actually important because if you think, for example, about the repeated games and players trying to sustain some cooperation in the repeated game, then obviously um, they can only provide incentives to each other up to the point uh, of the end of the horizon of the game. And when there is uh, the end of the horizon, then that limits, you know, the player's ability to provide the uh, incentive. Okay. Um, and um, we can think about, um, uh, in, in this class of games, we can think about uh, Markov equilibria, so equilibria in which uh, the um, actions of the players just depend on uh, the state X. Um, and perhaps in settings in which there are a lot of players uh, and players are anonymous, it's natural to think about uh, Markov equilibria. Uh, but when there are just two players, or when there is a small number of players, it's natural to think that they try to actually uh, sustain some type of better cooperation than in the Markov equilibrium by uh, conditioning how they play on past histories. Okay, and so, uh, we study in this game public perfect equilibria. Public perfect equilibrium is a profile of uh, public strategies. Uh, so strategies in which actions are functions of past histories. Uh, each player is choosing uh, a strategy like that and all players, they have to maximize the payoffs. This is the definition of a public perfect equilibrium. Okay. So now let me, uh, give you two examples. One example is uh, moral hazard in teams. So there are two players that uh, work on a project and uh, uh, each player at each moment of time either chooses no effort or effort to uh, contribute to the project and there is uh, some cost of effort. So players observe um, imperfectly with noise how much is the contribution of each player. Um, and uh, the project state is the sum of contributions. And if the project state hits zero, the project fails. And if the project hits uh, um, you know, some uh, upper value, then the project succeeds and players get the price. So the question is how much cooperation can the player sustain here? Um, and of course, the fact that there is a limited uh, time horizon could potentially limit the scope of uh, cooperation. Yuri, okay. can I uh, interrupt you? So there's a question from Elliot Lipnowski. Elliot, if you want to unmute yourself, please. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, feel free to defer this, but just, so what do we want to assume about the shape of the state space? Uh, so um, for this talk, let's assume that it's uh, compact and that uh, uh, the payoffs are bounded, but in the paper we actually um, allow uh, state spaces which are not compact and we uh, impose uh, some linear growth conditions. Uh, so um, maybe Eduardo can say... Like convex or... Huh? 
like convex or uh oh the this um we do not i do not believe we assume that uh, the state space is convex no it okay. just has to be convex okay. i mean in this in this sorry in this example it's just an interval right right yeah in this specific example it's just an interval from zero to some upper boundary but in general um you know it could be could be anything yeah so th this example is related to the classic paper of uh, Holmstrom moral hazard in teams. Uh, and uh, in this specific setting also, there is a paper by Georgiadis that studies uh, uh, Markov equilibria. So we can compare um, our, what we get to Markov equilibria. Okay. Uh, second example I want to show is uh, three player prisoners dilemma. Okay, so this is just a repeated game without uh, a payoff relevant state. So the states, they're uh, pure signals about the player's actions. So each player has two actions to defect or to cooperate. And cooperating is costly, but it contributes to the welfare of uh, all uh, players. Um, and uh, this is a repeated game, but it's not known how to characterize equilibria uh, in this specific game with three players. Uh, with two players, uh, um, I have a paper which uh, shows how to characterize equilibria with two players, but with three players is, is not known. Okay. Um, and at this point, let me maybe, um, so I cannot resist the temptation. I feel tempted to show you uh, what the payoff set looks like uh, in equilibrium of this game. So let me show you uh, what it looks like, okay? Um, and actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you something even better. Okay, let's uh, see. So you should be able to see this. Uh, um, they can rotate. Yep. And I can look at it from, uh, from different angles. And uh, it's just nice to, to have computer code that just produces this beautiful three-dimensional shape. And, uh, you know, we can look at it and we can try to understand, uh, you know, what happens in equilibrium. You know, it's uh, hard to imagine something like this in your head, but when your computer produces it and when you have it at your fingertips, you know, I think that this is, this is real beautiful. Okay, so let me explain what we see here. So what we see here is, huh? What are the colors? What are the colors? That's a good, that's a good question. So um, this is the set of payoffs that the players can achieve uh, in equilibrium. Um, and uh, the, the solid ones, the solid lines, those are feasible payoffs. Okay, so feasible payoffs, they are the payoffs of the stage game. Uh, but uh, players cannot achieve the payoffs of the stage game uh, completely because uh, of an incentive problem and because of noise. Because of noise, they can get something uh, less. And uh, the colors, they indicate the actions that the players choose um, when they try to achieve a particular point in the boundary of this set. Okay. So this point here, for example, is cooperation by all players. Uh, and the black color reflects cooperation by all players. Okay. Uh, in this point here, it reflects uh, one player uh, defecting, but two players are cooperating. So this is one removed from cooperation by all players. And the red color uh, is uh, uh, two players uh, cooperating, one defecting. And uh, in each of the... Uh, three leaves here, it's a, it's a different player. Okay. And the blue one, you can guess it, it's uh, uh, only one player is cooperating. Okay. Uh, so let me look at this set from, uh, from this angle here. Okay, so this is, this is very interesting. So, so this is the Nash equilibrium, okay? And the Nash equilibrium, it's a, it's a sharp part of the set, it's a vertex. So the set is not smooth here. Um, and then there are three leaves here. So you can see, you know, those, those three leaves, maybe from a different angle, you can see those, those leaves 
uh, even better. So those are flat portions, okay? And those flat portions correspond to an equilibrium in which only two players are trying to cooperate and the third player is just defecting um, forever. So they're also equilibria like that. Okay, so obviously the, the player that's defecting is benefiting from uh, the other two players trying to cooperate. Um, and it's an intrinsic feature of the set that the set is, is not smooth. Um, and uh, yeah, so... Um, um, and how is it that players are able to achieve these pairs? They uh, choose at the given moment of time to, for example, uh, in this case, all players are trying to cooperate. Uh, but depending on the signals they observe, they move to a different point of the set and uh, they alter their path of play, okay? And uh, for example, if uh, player one is uh, uh, seen to be um, defecting, right? Uh, you, you know, the, he's supposed to be cooperating and he's cooperating, but the signal looks like, you know, he's, get, he, he's generating a bad signal, then uh, uh, they're gonna move into this portion where the other players are gonna stop uh, uh, cooperating. So the uh, cooperation or defection by other players, it, it's history dependent on uh, uh, you know what what uh, one player is doing. Uh, what does the surface look like if you restrict yourself to Markov? To to say it again to Markov strategy. Oh, to Markov strategies. Okay. It must be a much smaller surface. Right. So the, yeah, exactly. So this is just a repeated game. So the Markov equilibrium is the Nash equilibrium. That's that corner there. Uh, so later I will show uh, what it looks like for a moral hazard in teams example. And in that case, there is going to be a, a mark of equilibrium there as well. So uh, we can see that one separately. But I'm going to postpone that for now. And uh, I am going to uh, come back to the slides. Okay, I think that these are my slides. Right, okay. Um, and uh, what is here on the slide is uh, the player's continuation values, that's a particular point of the set, are going to play a role. Um, and alternatively, we can think about a direction. So each point on the boundary of this set corresponds to maximization of paths in a particular direction, okay. Uh, and the direction of maximization also plays a role. Uh, and uh, next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go a little bit through the analysis and uh, show some, uh, show basically how we derive uh, uh, our results. Okay. Um, and in this analysis, uh, it's, it's kind of nice how everything hangs together. Uh, and there will be four things that are, you know, particularly mathematically elegant, and if I remember, I will point those out. Okay. Um, and uh, I'm going to start with the recursive structure of um, uh, these games. Uh, then I'm going to uh, talk about uh, how players create incentives, uh, how they can uh, create value to by providing incentives as efficiently as possible and show you the optimality equation. Uh, for the situations like, uh, like I showed that the set has various uh, kinks and edges, uh, we have to use viscosity solutions. So, um, and then I'm gonna uh, talk a little bit of, at the end about uh, how to compute things numerically and numerical examples. Okay. So recursive structure, of course, uh, stochastic state is one state variable. Although if it's just a pure signal, not payoff relevant, then it doesn't really uh, matter. Uh, and uh, continuation values of a players are uh, another vector state variable. So in order to understand what happens in these public perfect equilibria, we have to study this recursive structure. 
So continuation values reflect uh, future expected payoffs and how they change over time, the continuation values. Um, so there is a, a promise keeping condition. How continuation values change over time reflects the uh, player's payoff flow and expectation of the future. Okay. So uh, the current continuation value is going to be a weighted average of the current payoff flow and expectation of the future. So that's an expectation, but continuation values can also change with signals. And this part reflects how continuation value changes with respect to uh, a surprise in uh, signals re uh, relative to uh, what players uh, expect in the given uh, equilibrium. Okay. And uh, this coefficient is the stochastic driver of continuation value. It's the sensitivity of continuation values to signals. Uh, so this is tied to uh, incentives of the players. So the players have incentives if their future continuation values through signals depend on their actions. Next is the incentive constraint. So the incentive constraint, we have an incentive constraint of each player in each player cares about the flow payoff and the expectation of future continuation value. Uh, and the player has to maximize uh, uh, this sum as a result. Uh, and from here, we get an incentive condition, which tells us how different uh, sensitivities of continuation values to signals can enforce uh, different action profiles. Okay. Uh, so next is with this recursive structure, we can ask the question, well, what's the maximal set that the players can achieve in equilibrium? And we can characterize this largest set. Well, it's actually a correspondence because it's a separate set for the different stochastic states. Uh, so it's, it's the largest bounded self-generating set, uh, meaning that the largest set such that the states can be kept in it while respecting the, uh, the laws of motion from the previous slide uh, and the incentive constraints. Yuli, Yuli uh, can I interrupt you? We have a question from uh, Tomasz Satsik. Yep. Uh, ju ju okay, uh, just a quick question. So I understand you're maintaining the assumption that all the states are observable in this case, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. So, so because of that, it, well, the sufficient statistic for all the signals for actions taken at a given time is a change of those states at a given time. It's, it's, it's right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Okay. So this, this is like a convex set that we saw on, uh, uh, in, in MATLAB um, a little while earlier. And we found that it's useful to characterize this uh, convex set by its support function. So the support function tells us for any direction how far we can go in the given direction in the set. And if we have the support function for every single direction, it characterizes the whole convex set. In this direction, there is actually um, uh, important economic meaning in it. So uh, the direction uh, plays an important, it's the, it's the, these are the weights and the player's utilities. Uh, and the direction plays an important role, for example, in the risk sharing game of Kachara Lakota or, or in uh, uh, this uh, political compromise paper. So in games with perfect monitoring, for example, uh, this, the weights on the player's utilities and optimal equilibrium, they remain unchanged up until the point that uh, an incentive constraint of one of the players is binding and then, and then the, the weights change. But here, because of imperfect monitoring, the weights, they will change continuously. So um, how exactly the weights and utilities change? So this is something that I'm going to talk about next. So, but first of all, what's the relationship between the support function and the uh, continuation utilities? And the relationship is that, um, and it follows from envelope theorem that uh, the continuation utilities, they are the derivatives of the support function with respect to the weights and the player's utilities. Okay, so this is 
uh, uh, well-known fact from convex geometry. Uh, but this, this is giving us uh, continuation utilities as functions of the uh, state and direction. Um, and next, I'm going to tie how the direction changes with signals uh, and how uh, continuation values change with signals. So this is just the ethos formula. So if we have a, a direction changing with signals in a particular way, then how continuation values change with signals? Well, continuation values are a function of directions um, and the function of state. And the state changes in a particular way. Um, and uh, the uh, directions change in a particular way. And this uh, gives us how the continuation values change in response to signals. Um, and it could be that, um, it could be that direction is not changing. So uh, if uh, players are, you know, simply choosing their uh, best responses, then they don't need any incentives. So we don't need to provide any incentives by uh, shifting their future continuation values. So then this, this creates a natural level of incentives, which is, we can think about as, you know, these are Markov incentives. Or we can think about extra incentives that players create for each other by changing uh, future utility weights depending on uh, uh, observed signals. Okay, so next um, I am going to, um, well, okay, so this is, this is just um, a slide which says that uh, uh, when we change the uh, direction, so we, when we change the weights and the player's utilities, then uh, the strength of incentives that this creates depends on the uh, curvature of the set. So it depends on the uh, second derivative of uh, the uh, support function with respect to direction in the, in the given direction. Uh, and if the set is uh, less curved, then when the angle changes just a little bit, continuation values move by a lot. And when the set is more curved, then when the angle changes you know, by a little bit, then continuation values also change by a little bit. So the, the curvature of the set, it's like, you know, the, we can think about it as, you know, local risk aversion, right? Or something like that. Uh, it tells us about uh, how easy is it to transfer uh, future pairs between the players to create incentives. And in particular, if we are at the point where the set has a kink, so this uh, Hessian has the singularities, then incentives become restricted because of the kink, uh, there is a limit on how you can provide incentives to the players. Okay, so I think I'm, uh, let's see, uh, almost half an hour in. Okay, just keeping track of time. So next, um, I want to talk about how we derive the uh, optimality equation to characterize this uh, payoff correspondence. And here, what we found is that um, things can get really, really messy. But uh, if we ask the right question up front, then, then things will actually be super clean. So the next idea is, is going to make the derivation go like a hot knife on, on butter. And this is the idea is we are um, on the boundary of the set, for example, and we are trying to generate incentives as efficiently as possible, okay? So that means that if we uh, maximize the drift of the support function minus uh, the level uh, of the continuation value, then the maximum of the drift has to be zero. Okay. So what does it mean? It means that, uh, well, the maximum of the drift has to be zero. It means that it can never be uh, 
bigger than zero. It has to be uh, right. Uh, so the maximum of the of the drift has to be zero. So so basically, what this condition means is that um, we cannot make the continuation values uh, go inside. So we cannot uh, make this drift to be strictly positive because if we could make continuation values go inside, then we will be able to achieve something even uh, at a higher level. Um, and uh, we can actually achieve the, the drift to be zero because, because we can achieve equilibrium. So this is, this is the condition. And uh, uh, this condition is, um, Okay, um, right. This condition we can basically use it directly to derive our optimality equation. Okay, so this slide is just to show that uh, uh, we can use this condition completely mechanically. So the the drift of uh, the support function we can just use Ito's formula to uh, differentiate the support function with respect to x and get the drift of x, to differentiate the support function with respect to the direction and get the, uh, uh, the drift of the direction, which is some, some theta. Um, and then we have a, a second order eta term, which is a, a big term like this, okay? Um, and then here we have a product of a direction and continuation value. So we can just differentiate it uh, directly using Ito's formula. So the first two parts is like the product rule from regular calculus. This is the de derivative, the drift of uh, um, the direction. This is the derivative, the drift of continuation value. And this is the uh, product of volatilities. And then we have parts which, uh, which cancel out. And uh, if we uh, maximize this over uh, actions and over uh, volatilities of continuation values that uh, enforce a particular actions, then we basically get our optimality equation. Um, okay, so, um, and something which is very, very nice here uh, is that, um, Beta is the volatility of continuation values, and uh, this zeta is the volatility of direction. And it's interesting to observe that beta maximizes this expression, so it maximizes the drift, but zeta actually minimizes it. So zeta, the volatility of direction, which corresponds to uh, a particular volatility of uh, continuation values, is determined by a mix mean max problem. Okay, so in our optimality equation, we are going to have a mean max problem that jointly determines the optimal way of creating incentives by uh, creating a volatility of continuation values and equivalently by creating a volatility of the of the direction in which we maximize utilities. Okay, so this is this is our optimality equation. Um, and uh, I want to say that this could potentially be really, really messy, but it actually, you know, for a multidimensional problem looks uh, remarkably clean. Okay. And uh, there is this uh, max mean operator and uh, this mean might, might seem a little bit uh, surprising at first because uh, we are trying to maximize payoffs. So how come do we have this, this mean? Uh, but, uh, um, you know, this is this is this is the mean because this is it's determining the volatility of the direction of optimization in the dual space. So that's you know this is this is a really beautiful part that uh, the two things are determined uh, simultaneously. So our set is the greatest viscosity solution of uh, this equation, and in practice, uh, instead of solving uh, this equation, we actually solve uh, a brother of this equation. So it's a, uh, instead of an elliptic equation, this is a parabolic equation, which uh, uh, instead of looking for the fixed point, 
we are actually doing a version of uh, APS. So we are starting with a set which is strictly bigger than uh, uh, our equilibrium correspondence and we are shrinking it using this, uh, this parabolic equation. Uh, so, um, let me say a couple of words about viscosity solutions, okay. So viscosity solutions, they are defined for equations like this, which are uh, monotone in this uh, Hessian. Okay. And what does it mean monotone in the Hessian? Well, the, the Hessian, it's a symmetric matrix. And if we increase uh, Hessian by a positive semi-definite amount, it means that the right-hand side should increase. Okay. And how to think about it intuitively? So the Hessian determines the, the curvature of this uh, equilibrium payoff surface. And if you make it less curved, then uh, uh, the, this equation is monotone in the Hessian, means that we can actually attain uh, bigger payoffs because we can provide the incentives at less cost. So that's, that's the intuition behind it. Um, and viscosity solutions, they are defined uh, formally using uh, concepts of super solutions and sub solutions. Uh, super solution is a, is a function which uh, informally satisfies one inequality, a sub-solution satisfies another inequality. Uh, and these functions, they, they, could, they don't have to be uh, uh, twice continuously differentiable. So what does it mean when something is a sub-solution? It means that if you take any uh, twice continuously differentiable test function, and if you look at this uh, 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 test function, then this test function uh, has to have a lower Hessian. So uh, viscosity solutions is defined by comparison to uh, C2 uh, functions, which are tangent to the solution. So we, uh, we take this, this uh, curve uh, manifold, which potentially has edges and kinks, and then we uh, apply to it test functions, and that way we check that this is indeed a viscosity solution. Um, and these test functions, they can be used to uh, carry out all kinds of local arguments, which is what we take advantage of. Um, and uh, um, nothing special needs to be done to accommodate edges and vertices. Uh, there are uh, uh, existence and uniqueness results, which are readily available for viscosity solutions. And uh, numerical schemes, they work very well for, for viscosity solutions. Um, so next I have a few slides which talk about uh, the numerical scheme that we use to uh, compute solutions. So I think I will probably skip them, but I'm just going to say that it's all based on uh, representing this quadratic form uh, that contains the Hessian using uh, grid points. Um, uh, in a in a monotone way, okay. And the reason we it has to be done in the monotone way is because we have a result which tells us that any monotone, consistent and stable finite difference numerical scheme converges to the viscosity solution. Uh, and monotone means that when we construct this numerical scheme, then when we update value at a given grid point it means that it depends positively on values at other grid points. And this is an intuitive property because the uh, value function uh, the, 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 or the, the utility level uh, phi depends positively on utility levels in other directions that are used to, uh, to generate a given direction. Okay, so I think that um, uh, a nice, uh, uh, way to conclude would be to see this example of moral hazard in teams, right? Okay, so uh, let me come back to this moral hazard uh, in teams example. Uh, this is an example where two players are working on the project, they're putting in effort, uh, they, there are signals about effort, um, and uh, if the project uh, state hits zero, then the project fails, and if it hits, in this example, 20, then the project succeeds and each player gets a prize of 
of A. Um, and one of the things that I want to add to this example is uh, to ask the question, well, what happens if observability changes? And we have to do this carefully. So we, we are going to reduce the noise of the signal, but at the same time, we have to make sure that fundamentally the stochastic setting is still the same. So we are going to add some extra noise to the stochastic state. So the stochastic state has the same volatility and there is the same option value as, as before. Okay. So here's a, a graph which um, uh, has Markov uh, perfect equilibrium. And this is the cross section of the set uh, along the symmetric direction. So this is a, a symmetric pair. And we can see that there is Markov equilibrium. Uh, so th there is a range above where players, they clearly have incentives to, to put in effort. So when players are close to completion of the project, uh, and when they have, they, they have this prize hanging in front of them that they're going to get very, very soon, they try to get there as fast as possible. They, they have strong incentives. So they, they're just putting it effort away. They don't put any effort, but in the middle, uh, there, there are some effort level uh, that uh, players choose in the Markov equilibrium, but they can try to do better. In fact, they can do better uh, and they can also do uh, do worse. And the fact that they can do worse uh, is important for creating an incentive to do better. So the, the red here is first best. They can get pretty close to first best. And uh, green is what would happen if they put in zero effort. Uh, and uh, uh, this is actually not individually rational to put in zero effort. So if your opponent is putting in zero effort in this game, you're going to put effort uh, sometimes. So here is a beautiful Maybe, graph, uh, which, huh? Maybe just a heads up that we have about two minutes. I don't know if you want to leave time for a question or two, but it's-, it's Yeah. Your... Right. Um, so let me just, 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 just say, say a couple of things. So this is a graph which shows the cross section of the sets for different values of the state. And uh, you can see that, you know, it can, uh, it, it basically, you know, nice pretty graph. This is a graph which shows that when uh, noise is reduced, then players can, uh, can achieve uh, uh, a bigger portion of the feasible and individually rational set. Okay, so um, I'm going to say a couple of things to conclude and then I'm going to show you the 3D pictures and I'm going to flip it uh, for, for the question. So uh, this is an important class of games and we characterize uh, equilibria. Uh, we derive an optimality equation that characterizes equilibria in this class of games. Uh, and we were able to implement this equation numerically so that we have a, a you know, code which can produce uh, various uh, uh, highly visual uh, pictures. And at this point, I'm going to switch to, uh, let me switch to this graph. This is, yes. And uh, really just, I am going to ask you to, to wrap up if you don't mind so that we can finish on time, but, but then sort of maybe people right. want to interact and stick around. Yes. Yeah. So this, this is, uh, this is what the set looks like in three dimensions, uh, for moral hazard in teams. And yes, sorry. Um, I think I'm, oh, 1030. Okay. Perfect. It's 1030 in California. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. So yeah, thanks very much really for, uh, for a great talk and beautiful pictures. So,